I'm Victor Prudel. I'm the uh, director of marketing at Intel on the Silicon Photonics project. Uh, actually, I've been working on this project since we started in 2000. So, 12, 14 years. Uh, I, I started it in 2003. Um, it's a very complicated project, and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit, bit more. But the first eight or nine years was uh, spent on doing basic research on a lot of these devices. Uh, a lot of the work didn't exist. People didn't know how to do this sort of thing. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing that I try to do is, and hopefully people won't get annoyed, uh, I try to insert trivia, things, things that are nice to know about optics and, and other things, just to make things a little bit more fun. Uh, okay, so let me talk about uh, photon the advantages of photonics. We call it photonics versus optical. It means the same thing, except optical also means eyeglasses, telescopes, you know, etc. Photonics is just uh, communications with light. So uh, communicating with photons is got fundamental advantages over over electrons. Photons have no mass; they're pure energy, and they don't interfere with each other. So an electron, if you guys know what EMI is, electromagnetic interference, you get multiple wires there, you get the electromagnetic waves, they cross over each other, it causes noise, it limits how far your signal can go. Yes, you can use amplifiers, signal conditioners, they cost, they add money, and they add cost, and they add power. Optical devices can go much, much further. Uh, so for example, Ethernet, 10 gig, you can go seven meters with a passive copper cable, 20 meters with an active, um, 300 meters with inexpensive, relatively inexpensive optics, and 80 kilometers with a $15,000 uh, So just a fundamental advantage. Other advantages of optics, the cables are much lighter. I've seen pictures of data centers where they've cabled them, and they've actually had to reinforce the floors because of the weight of the copper cables. Um, the oops. Okay, so you may, may say, so uh, actually, the previous slide. So why aren't why don't I see optical devices used all over the data center today? And the answer is they're expensive. They're made out of things that call with three, three five materials: uh, column three and five and periodic table of elements, um, exotic materials: indium phosphide, gallium arsenide. Uh, the state of the art is three inch wafers. I had actually left Intel four years ago, went to one of these companies, worked there for two years. And when I worked there, the yields that we had on our lasers was 7%. Right? That's, I don't understand how they stay in business, how they did, but that's what it was. The other thing on these optical devices, they're made in metal cans, they're hand assembled, they're, alive, they're gold plated, about 95 parts, they're hand tested and assemble. UPH on one of our lines was, I think it was 16 units an, uh, an hour. Uh, they actually have to, some of them light up. Fiber is 50 microns, right? So you need an operator to light up everything, <coughs> use a micro microscope and align them. And so it's just expensive. Uh, one of the other things is you need a epoxy called index batching epoxy, just how the light bends through the epoxy. I used to tell people, that it, uh, this epoxy costs more than cocaine per ounce. But then, of course, but then it asked, well, how do you know that? <laughs> like, well, someone told me, because I, I, I don't do that stuff. So instead, now I just use the example that it's more expensive than cocaine, which it is. Uh, and again, people just told me this. I don't, I don't know from, from any kind of practice. Or, um, so what is silicon photonics then? Okay, so I already explained what photonics is. Silicon photonics is making optical devices out of silicon in a single shot. Silicon is sand. It's the most abundant element in the Earth's crust, so it's very, very cheap. Um, you make it in a CMOS fab. Intel makes a million CPUs a day. So you know, we know how to, it, and I'm not coding, I'm just saying we have that expert, expertise. We have 50,000 people you know, in the manufacturing of devices. You know, we've optimized things uh, quite a bit. Um, other piece of trivia, we, we actually have $65 billion invested in fabs across the world. 
So we just have this huge infrastructure, right? We automating the manufacturing, automating the test, so we get the advantages of optics, high speed, long distance, with the advantage of very, very low cost uh, optical devices. Also, feel free to add, ask me questions at any point. So, someone once asked me, so Victor, how are you making optical devices out of silicon? You know, I hold up the chip, and you know, I can't see through it, so how do you do that? Well, what I'm showing here is the optical spectrum. Uh, light is nothing more than electromagnetic ratio, same as AM, FM radio waves, except the different wavelengths, they act differently. Visible light spectrum is roughly 400 to 800 microns. Um, silicon is transparent to anything over 1100 nanometers. And I, say, I thought I said microns before I meant nanometers. Uh, anything over 1100 nanometers, we operate at 1310. The 1310 just happens to be an industry standard in telecom, so we chose that. Uh, so the way we do it, we get a wafer put an oxide, a silicon oxide coating on it, silicon oxide, and then we etch waveguides in it. And, and the, the, the optical guys are cringe if you hear me say this, the, the engineers. But the, the oxide essentially acts as a mirror. So it keeps the light in the waveguide. Here is a, another picture of a waveguide. We can bend it, we can split it, we can join it. We can put multiple colors of light in one fiber. We can split it using a prism-like uh, device. So it's very easy to, to operate with. The biggest advantage with silicon photonics is, you know, rather than all that hand assembly and expensive epoxy, we're printing these devices. We're just lithographically printing them. So very, very cheap. We're not on three inch wafers, we're on 12 inch. Uh, so just fundamentally cheaper. This is a SEM, a scanning electron microscope of one of our devices, basically a micron high, micron wide. For the wave cracks, and that's dictated by the color of light that we use. <clears throat> so this talks to the building blocks, and I'll talk a little bit about why it took us so long uh, to get to where we're at. Um, so the first device that we need is a laser, a light source. Um, Silicon, I'm, I'm not I'm trying to explain it, just trust me. Silicon is an indirect band gap material, so it can't laze, it cannot spontaneously emit uh, photons. Um, we actually jokingly say it, 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 if you put enough of electricity across it, it, it will emit light once, you know, along with some smoke, uh, but it won't, it won't laze. Um, so one of the things that we had to do is create something called a hybrid silicon laser, where we took waveguides, wave, waveguides act as the gain medium, we we'll put a bar, a small bar, medium phosphide over it. We had to figure out a way to bond the two together. The gap between them has to be uh, on the order of like 10 angstroms. And that was a four year project uh, just by itself, figuring that out, how to do the bonding. <clears throat> Next thing, we need to guide the light, split, combine. Um, you know, split it is in two paths. Uh, as well as you know, separating the different colors of light. The next thing is modulation, putting the ones and zeros on the light. It turns out that uh, our first devices will be at 25 gig. You cannot directly modulate a laser at 25 gig. By that I mean turn it on and off like a light switch. It just, the device heats up and cools off, that takes time, and the light will, will just not be accurate. <clears throat> That was uh, two or three years. Uh, the way we split the, we do the modulation with something called a mock sender interferometer. We don't need to know that. But two properties of light, the, uh, laser light. Uh, next thing is lasers don't exist in nature. They have to be made by, by man. Um, laser light is all the same color and all the waves are in phase. So what you do is you take an MZI device, you split the light, so you're cutting it in half, and then there's something called the plasma optical effect. If you put a photon through a electronic field, it will change phase. You have to put the right amount of electricity in there. Uh, so what happens is when the two waves meet, they cancel each other out. Versus if I want a one, I put no electricity on there, and then they come back together and re recombine. Uh, that was actually very complicated because 
Um, we actually needed that electric field. We needed uh, seven or eight uh, different electric fields. You can imagine you have to have the circuitry down so that you know as the photon is going through, you're varying the electricity in you know, each one of these these arms. Uh, so a lot of people said when we, we started that 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 could not be done. Photon detectors. So silicon is transparent to infrared light. So when I get a photon in. I want to convert it back to an electron on the far side. How do I do it? It's just going to pass through. So the way we do that um, is we grow a layer of germanium on top of the wafer. Um, it's called an epitaxial growth, which is a fancy way of saying it's a crystal growth. So all the atoms line up, they line up with each other, right? The germanium atoms on top of the silicon. Turns out germanium uh, atoms are 4% bigger than silicon. You know, so as they start growing, they start, you know, getting strained and eventually you get cracks and it causes all kinds of bad things. And we, we had to figure out how to solve that. We ended up using an annealing process to get the cracks to the edge and keep it straight. <clears throat> um, low cost assembly, we've solved all these problems now. Uh, when we started the state of the art on the modulation was 20 megahertz. Our first modulator was one gig. A year and a half we were 10 gig and then a year after that we were 40 gig. Um, Low cost assembly, doing things like V grooves in the silicon so you can do the attached on the fibers, um, you know, automating the manufacturing. There are, yes, we can make a million CPUs a day, but these are somewhat different devices. So we're in the phase now where we're automating the manufacturing. I cannot talk, or I'm not gonna talk about schedules or pricing, that comes later. Um, and then finally, there's the CMOS circuitry. Photo detectors look like they have infinite impedance. If you know anything about electrical engineering, you have to do impedance matching. So we have to do things like the trans, trans impedance amplifiers, amplifiers, uh, the drive circuitry for the lasers, all that sort of thing. Questions on any, anyone? What kind of power are we talking about? Uh, let me not answer that. That will, that will be part of when I announce pricing and. Uh, but it's a, it's a fraction of what, what we use today. What we use today. So, so but basically it's a different process than the process that used for logic. So I guess you, you want to is the same die with logic, yes? We need to a few down in the same. It's a different problem. It, it's, it's the same fat, okay? It's the same fat. But we use an existing fat. But some of the processes are different, right? You know, like, you know, for, for, for example, Putting it upside down and etching the oxide. Slightly different process, you don't use that with transistors. What theory do they use for modulation? Uh, that's a. That's a. That's a okay. Um, last session, one person person figured this out. Um, even I've been using this picture for about six months. Uh, so another piece of trivia, 20 years ago when you would do press, you know, you'd go to a newspaper and they'd have like 200 reporters. Today they have like 10, right, because of the internet. Um, I grew up in Chicago, uh, there was a Chicago Sun-Times. It's one of the top 20 newspapers in the country. And I just read three months ago that uh, Chicago Sun-Times uh, laid off their last photographer. And no longer can even afford photographers. So one of the tricks I've, I've found is I actually do photography and articles for the, the newspapers. They're very likely to print them uh, because I'm saving them work. So this is a little bit of a fun picture. Anyone recognize the motivation for this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo. Famous <coughs> two fingers ready to touch. And if you we even got the shade. I, 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 I had a photographer do this. All the shading down. And, and actually, I, I should get that picture. Okay, then we can test on another photograph. Okay. Um, so we worked with Corning. Uh, I, if you know what Light Peak was, it was a program to put optics in laptops. I had started that program in uh, 2007. It, it didn't work. Um, but I started working with Corning, very, very reputable company. I don't know if Corning, I was pointing because the Corning guy was here before. Some trivia about Corning, very reputable, very honest, and very good business goals. 
Um, besides inventing Pyrex, uh, they also do the grill glass on your phones. Um, the company's been around for over 150 years. And the other piece of trivia is they made the glass for Thomas Edison's first light bulb. Yeah, yeah. I was surprised when I heard that. They also made Corningware, but they sold that off. They don't do that anymore. Okay, so I started working with them on fiber. We use a different color light, 1310, uh, than everyone else uses for data centers. Everyone else uses 815. And there is a issue with fiber called chromatic dispersion. So other piece of uh, trivia, whenever you talk here, an uh, optical guy talk, you know, talk about light is particles, photons, and light is waves. And it's just the way we describe it. There's something called the light particle duality. It just depends on the effect you use, you know, one or the other to explain it. So I'm gonna talk light into a fiber. The, you're never gonna get that laser exactly straight. There's always going to be some amount of angle in it. And, what, and also the beams uh, spread a little. What happens is, so some of the photons will start bouncing off the inside of the walls. And what happens is each photon takes a slightly different path. If it takes a different path, some of them are traveling further than others. And if they're traveling further, it takes them longer to get there. So you get this elongation of the of the pulse, and eventually, this is supposed to show it that you, you, you can't differentiate those pulses. The Vixels, that's the kinds of lasers that are used today, um, they're limited to 70 to 100 meters at, at uh, uh, 25K. Why am I telling you this? Because it's an advantage that we have over, over the competition, obviously. What we got Corning to do, and so this, this effect is called dispersion. We got Corning to modify the fiber um, and basically, there's, there's a cladding area, the outside area, where it, it reflects different color of lights differently, different angles, so that it's more likely to come all, all the colors. They're, they're, I said laser is one color, but there is a slight band, so that there's only a slight amount of distortion. We go 300 meters because of this effect. You know, something. And what's happening in data centers, data centers are getting big as we move to cloud computing. Uh, today's lasers, the Vixels can go 300 meters and they're going down to 100. Right? We're at 300 um, going down. The other thing is light, or I'm sorry, fibers have a bend radius. Uh, so you take a fiber, fibers are 120 microns, uh, about the size of a human hair. And there's an inner area where the light is confined, and then there's an external area called the cladding. In the cladding is a dopant. And the dopant keeps it excited as the mirror keeps the light in there. The inside area is 50 microns, the outside is uh, 120. And just another piece of trivia, uh, fiber is glass, it's just it's glass. Uh, it actually has a tensile strength stronger than steel, but it's still only 120 microns. Um, what happens, oh, what I was going to say is the 99% uh, of the material in a fiber is glass, less than, it's actually 99 point something, less than a half percent is dopant, and the dopant is 99% of the cost. So the, the dopant is, used to be titanium, I don't know what they dope uh, fiber is now. What happens is that you can exceed a bend radius on the fiber. If it's too much, the light will leak out, right, and go straight. So Corning, the other thing they did is they have something called a clear curve. Uh, they're able to get a bend radius of about seven millimeters versus 35. Uh, think magic marker you know, versus coffee cup. And the reason why that's important is our customers want routing flexibility. At 25 gig, it's hard to route signals. And if you're doing it with fiber, you can put things anywhere, right in the back and the side. And you know, we have to go around, obviously I exaggerate you know, various things and you want those type bend radiuses. Okay, and we'll get to that is. So we're having a little bit of fun with the photographs. I, I, there's a friend of mine who does the wall. Huh? And the wall, there's something in the movie, the wall, right? Yeah, yeah. What it's supposed to be is, 
on, the, on the left is a copper cable, PCI Express Gen 3, 16 lanes. Uh, this is 128 gig. This is 1.6 terabits, so 12 and a half times. This weighs about 10 pounds. This is less than a pound. Um, you know, 12 and a half. So I mentioned, you know, lighter and thinner in terms of the cables. This is something else that we're working on. Um, the existing optical Connectors are called MTP, designed in 1987, so it's 25-year-old technology. Um, they got 27 parts in them, they're expensive. Um, so one of the things, this is one of the programs I worked on, is work again with Corning. Um, you know, fewer parts, fewer parts, lower manufacturing costs, lower part costs, ruggedized, we're using material systems, you know, 21st century. Um, we're able to get 64 fibers, in there, uh, 20, 25 gig, 64 is 1.6. Um, it's got more fibers, it's more rugged, fewer parts, it's smaller and a third of the cost. So it's the corning. Huh? This is also corning. It's, it's actually a combination of corning and US Connect. Uh, corning owns 49% of US Connect. How do you split them back to the, how do you split them back to, uh, smaller groups? Oh, you do optical um, uh, cables. And you can you know, go from 64 to 888. Or whatever, whatever it is. You know. So, uh, biggest cause of cable failure in the data center today is dust. Uh, 50 micron fiber, it doesn't take much dust. Um, they actually circulate a lot of the, the air. Sometimes they don't clean it. Depends on who the data center is. And so what we've done is we've built into, this thing is called a ferro, into their beam expander. So we go from 50 microns to 170. And then it goes from one, connect, one connector to a plug to a plug. And then on the other side, it goes back down. And if you remember your high school, grade school, math, area of the circle is pi r squared, right? So you're squaring. And so, you know, that's whatever 40 micron piece of dust. You know, I bought the light here. It's dimmer, but it's still working. So 10x the dust. Let me skip that one because I talked to him. Talk about rack scale architecture. Let's talk about the prob problems we're solving, the real problems we're solving with rack scale architecture. And I'm going to make up the numbers. Every customer is different, how their architecture is. People want to follow Moore's law, upgrade their CPUs. You know, every two years. It's easier to upgrade a CPU than build a new data center. Data centers are about a billion dollars each for a large, a large one. The issue is, if you go and look at one of these boards, you know, let's say that the CPUs are $2,000, but everything is soldered down on that board. And I'm throwing three away $5,000 worth of all their stuff to upgrade $2,000. You know, hard drive is probably soldered in. You're not going to see that here. It's a different architecture. Here with OCP. Um, Nix, memory, all this stuff is, is down. And you might say, well, why not have a different, ca you know, have a hard drive tray and a whatever tray? OCP does that. Other people don't. Uh, the issue is when we use PCI Express to connect up everything to each other, you go up that power of PCI Express. Um, with copper, you can do that. So that's one of the, the, probably the biggest feature of the rec scale architecture. We're using optics. Um, you only have to pay to upgrade what you want to upgrade. If you want to upgrade the NICS, you only have to upgrade the NICS. And, and vice versa. This architecture is actually a little bit cheaper than the typical uh, uh, rack architecture. But where you're really saving is the total cost of ownership, the upgrade. Right, because you're only paying to upgrade what you, what you want. Other big advantage here, um, a tray like this today probably is 10 gig optics. We actually put, and it's hard to see, this is this mezzanine card. I'll be done in a few minutes, Jay. This is a mezzanine card. These are the optical modules. We actually put three of them on there. The other thing that we do is, you know, we bought full from the NIC chips. We actually put the NIC chips on here rather than the top of rack switch. So now I'm switching very close 
to the source uh, decreasing latency. All right, so I got a lower cost system, faster, um, and then I have a patch panel at the top, which there I configure it. I can have redundant uh, networks, a fiber channel, ether, or ethernet. I can build Taurus. I can build pretty much whatever I want. So it's a very flexible system. Uh, the other thing, and I think Jay, you, are you covering this? Um, not to this level of G. Oh, okay. Um, you can have either Xeon. Each of these is a sled. 15 trays in a rack, three sleds per, per, per tray. And I can have a Xeon tray or a Atom tray, and I can mix and match. I can't mix sleds, but I can mix trays within a rack. Plus I have the optics, plus I have the option of having the, the uh, full com switch to question. So, so the free box is that's a sort of, this is just a cartoon, obviously. That's, that's them there. And then this green represents the MXC cable that would come out the front and then go to a patch panel on the top. You'll see all this on the floor. You're not mass producing it. Yeah? Competition on the You're not mass producing it yet, so. Um, but no comment. No. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I want to do more of an announcement like Apple does, right? Where you, you don't know they're coming out with an iPad, and then one day you, you know you wake and then you get you see all this big wow. You know, if you look at Intel, in, no offense to Jay here or anyone else, I mean, partly we have to we have to tell everyone two, three years in advance because HP, IBM, our OEMs, they need lead time to build the systems. But what happens is when we ship a, a Xeon microprocessor, well, everyone knows everything, right? There, there is no big announcement. Uh, so I want to have kind of a bigger announcement and surprise people. So, you know, now, you notice I, I talk more about solutions, the problems that we're solving, as opposed to Here's the shape and the size of my modulator, and how many you, know, you asked about power, how many microwatts of you know dark current or whatever it is. And I'll do that later. Question: Do you have any um, with these building blocks? Do you have any thoughts about using uh, a photonics inside the chip? Um, yes. So, and, and let me know if you. No, you go. So. Um, we have a three-phase approach. So long-term, and this is 15 years out, right? You buy a CPU, there's no electrical connectors on it, there's just a fiber coming out of it, right? It, it's monolithic integration. And then what we're doing now is discrete. And basically the point is, um, I don't want, let's say Jay is doing the modulator, I don't want him to be gated by me because I'm late on the laser or my yields are bad and I ruin the yields for everyone. So he goes at his own pace with his own chip, I do mine, and then we put them down on PCB. So that's what we're doing now. Intermitt intermittent will do um, uh, co-packaging. So you buy one chip, but there's two packages there, right? And then the, the model doesn't But it's not, it's, you're not thinking about computing with dice. Nah, that's, people ask me, I don't know how you do that. It will communicate with photonics, but not compute. Right? Yeah, IBM makes announcements like that once in a while. It's, I, but that's 50 years out, or, or 30 years. Out. Okay, other questions? 
Okay. Thank you.